We've talked about our sheep. We've talked about several different topics, but we're going to talk about nutrition today and what all goes into making this feed. What is in this feed? Is there a difference between feeds? I've got three different samples right here. And why does feed for a horse look different than feed for a sheep or a cow or for a goat or for a pig? And so we're going to talk about those things today. First thing we're going to talk about, this is the ruminant digestive system. All right. Monogastrics are humans and pigs. Sheep, goats, cattle are ruminants. That means they have a full compartmentalized stomach. And so when we start talking about it, you can see this little tube right here. This is the esophagus. And the first part comes in here to the reticulum. It's kind of a holding area. And then we have the rumen here on this whole compartment. And so I'm going to turn it around, and you can see the outline. All this whole area is all the rumen. It makes up about 70% of the ruminant digestive system. And in that rumen is very important because this is where everything happens, okay? What makes it happen? We'll get a question out there. Some of you guys can respond. What makes the ruminant digestive system work, okay? And we're going to come back to that here in just a minute. We'll see what kind of questions we get out there. But as we go through here, we're going to talk about how the ruminant digestive system works from the time I feed this feed to my lamb. How long until it comes out as lamb pellets out the other end, okay? And so it can take upwards of 100 to, you know, 96 to 124 hours to get through this whole system. So that's why it's important when we're feeding our lambs and getting them ready for the show, we need to be tracking how much we feed them each time. And that's kind of what we talked about last week with our little notebook, keeping track of everything that we feed them, because it takes time to go through this system. So it's going to spend a lot of time in the room, and in the big room in here is a fermentation chamber. And so, Dottie, did we get any question or any answers to our question about what's in a rumen? Dr. Ramsey, I know they're going to be answering soon. There is just a little bit of delay between Facebook and the great news that you're sharing. So I know that our smart people watching are going to be coming in soon. Speaking of all of our smart people watching, we already have over 60 folks watching with us. We have folks from Crowley, Texas, Corsicana, even Ohio. So folks are tuning in, and I'm pretty sure somebody's going to know the answer to that. So we'll get back to them here in a second. <laughs> All right, so we're going to come back here in just a second on that. So we spend a lot of different time in the rumen. And so when I feed this feed, whether it's hay or pellets or some type of textured feed that I'm going to feed to my animal, it has to be broken down, whether by chewing or fermentation, to the size of about two millimeters before it passes through. When it leaves the rumen, it goes to the next one, which is the omasum. Okay, and if you can look there, I'll try to get a little close. You can see the omasum has lots of little layers. And so a common name for the omasum is the butcher's Bible. And these little layers in there act as a filter. And that prohibits or limits particle size passing through and keeps everything smooth. So as it goes into the abomasum, and this is one thing that I want you to remember, the abomasum is the true stomach. So once it gets here, abomasum in your sheep or goat, this is the same type of stomach that you and I have. So this is where acid digestion occurs. And so here in the rumen, this big compartment is what makes the ruminant animal live. They eat fiber, hay, all of these different things. And we're going to go ahead and give you the answer you guys out there, bacteria, okay? Bacteria and protozoa live in this rumen, and they are what make the ruminant animal survive. They take this type of forage that we cannot, as monogastrix, we cannot digest. The little bacteria, okay, they can break it down. And so your sheep or coat or cow, or steer, whatever you're feeding, eats the feed, <laughs> The rumen provides the environment, okay? It's the right pH. It needs to be about 6.8, which is very 
neutral, okay? And because if we get too acidic, which means it gets very hot in there, and you talk about feeding hot rations, or you hear somebody say something, they burned his rumen, what that means is the pH dropped too low and we kill the bacteria. So it's very important that we maintain a good bacterial colony in this rumen because they take all of these ingredients and convert them into what we call bacterial crude protein and volatile fatty acids. Now the volatile fatty acids are become the energy source for that animal. So when they need energy, that's where they get it. The bacterial crude protein is just like what it says. The little bacteria that grow, they wash out of the rumen. It's kind of like a, a roller coaster ride. They go through the omasum and then they end up in the abomasum and that's where they are digested. And so they become, the bacteria become the protein source a lot of times for the animal. So regardless, if I'm feeding a pig and I'm feeding these certain proteins, that's what he gets. If I'm feeding a sheep or a ruminant, doesn't really matter what all protein I have in this feed because the main part of it is going to be changed by bacteria. And so that's why knowing how to read a feed tag, knowing what's in your feed tag helps for performance on your animals, okay? Dot, if we get any questions out there, just make sure that they holler. Holler them out. <clears throat> so the next thing we're going to do is talk about a feed tag. Okay? So feed tags have to be on your bag of feed. And so one thing, hopefully you guys have gone and gotten this printed off or where you can look at it, we've got different samples of feed tags. And if we look at A, and we're doing this because I often get this question if I'm judging a show somewhere and somebody's got a real big gangly lamb that's really skinny and really tall, doesn't have a lot of muscle definition. A lot of times I'll ask them, how much are you feeding this animal? And they say, we're feeding him five pounds a day of an 18% protein ration with a 40% protein supplement. Guess what? He is not going to get fat feeding him that type of feed because he is burning. There's too much protein in the diet. So you're burning all the extra energy off of him. So when we start off, Young lambs, okay, the first 60 days of age, 60 to 80, they need a high protein, 18%. But as your animal gets older, the protein level will decrease. And so most show feeds are going to run anywhere in that 15 to 16% protein. And so that's an important thing to know. If I'm trying to get my animal fat, okay, I may decrease the amount of protein or I want to increase the amount of fat in his diet. And so the big things that we want to look at on our feed tag, how much protein do we have, how much crude fat, and how much crude fiber. Now most of our diets <clears throat> that we have, like this feed here, and we're going to talk about what gives us crude fiber. In this case, it's got a lot of cottonseed holes in it. We're going to talk about that shortly. The fiber is what keeps the animal healthy, okay? That's what the bacteria are also eating in there. And so it's important that we remember that this whole system is made to run on fiber. And if you're just feeding feed out of a feed sack, that's even though it's 13 to 15% fiber, that's not enough fiber, okay? We want to incorporate some type of hay long stem forage, okay? And this is hay, another name for fiber, or roughage. And we'll see that here in just a second on our worksheet. But these little sticks and stems like that poke into the side of the rumen, and that stimulates that rumen turnover. And that stimulates, there's some little things called papilla little fingers where digestion and absorption occur that are in this rumen, and that keeps them happy. We see a lot of problems in goats especially, and sometimes in sheep, when they're getting nothing but a pelleted ration like this, the fiber is too small, it's not enough, okay? And so we see a lot of digestive problems, ulcers primarily, in animals that don't get enough fiber. So. <clears throat> Crude protein is important to look at 
we want that somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, somewhere in that 14 to 18, depending on what type of animal. The younger they are, the more higher the protein level needs to be. A lot of people just stick with one typical feed, somewhere around 16% is a good number, and then never move that. All right, the next one we're gonna look at is fat. A lot of these feeds vary from about two to 5% fat. And so fat is important because that gives an animal energy. If I'm really tracking him, I'm really working him hard, or we're trying to get that bloom on one, then I want a feed that has a higher fat level, okay? Now, I've gotta be careful. There's no different than me eating bluebell ice cream every night. If I eat too much bluebell ice cream, I'm gonna get fat. But if I need energy, that's what I'm gonna to go to. All right, we talked about fiber. Most of our feeds are gonna be right in there in that 11 to 13% fiber. Here's an important one that I want you to know, and this is oftentimes when we talk about our sheep skillathon program, it's really important that you look at is calcium to phosphorus ratio. We need to be two parts calcium to one part phosphorus, two to one ratio, okay? And so that's important because in sheep and goats, we have a problem called urinary calculi or kidney stones. And if I get my phosphorus too high, I can get these kidney stones that form in the bladder and then plug up the urinary tract on our sheep and goats. Huge problem in goats. Now, even though I have a feed that has the proper calcium phosphorus ratio of two to one, if I'm adding a supplement or I'm adding more grain to that product, okay, that's what's in the feed bag, then I can get that proportion out of whack. And so that's one thing that you need to be aware of. Anything that you add to that feed, you're gonna change that ratio. Now, a lot of our feeds are gonna have salt in them. That's just for palatability and keep them to eating. And then they're gonna have, if we're feeding sheep, the one thing that we wanna look at is copper, okay? Copper is one of those minerals that can kill your sheep. If they get too much, it can be toxic. So that's why you wanna be careful and make sure we're only feeding our sheep a feed labeled for sheep. So if you run out, don't go get any pig feed. Don't go get cattle feed, okay? Make sure and feed animals proper feeds that are made for them, all right? And so if we look on our list here, we can see one down here at the bottom, the max copper is 20. That's way too high. We need that copper to be somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to 12 parts per million, okay? eight to 12 parts per million. Now, you wanna be real careful because a lot of our goat feeds, and a lot of people think sheep and goats are the same, right? But a lot of our goat feeds have higher copper levels, and so we've seen several occasions I'm feeding that lamb goat feed that's high copper level, and then that lamb has a copper toxicity problem. All right, so those are the parts of the feed tag, protein, fat, fiber, calcium phosphorus ratio, and so as we go through here, we got any questions out there? We've got one question uh, that we've got come in is what is the relationship between fat in the feed and volatile fatty acids? That's a good question. Volatile fatty acids are energy. We talked about that earlier. And so one thing that we get higher fat, that produces more volatile fatty acids, which is higher energy level for your animals. And so that's one thing to look at if you're trying to put more bloom on them, okay? You wanna feed a feed that's gonna be higher in fat. All right, the other thing that volatile fatty acids were made from is corn. And so as we look through here, let's talk about now our ingredients. Now that we've talked about what's on the feed level, somebody tell me something that's in their feed. As we look out there, I'm gonna slip around here on the other side of the table. And so one of the big components of most everybody's feed is going to be corn. Now, our corn starts off like this, okay? Whole corn. What is the problem with that? The, well, the problem is that is hard to digest. And so a lot of feed companies, what they're going to do is they're going to process that corn. And so we have different types of products 
Here we have some cracked corn. Okay, and that's mainly just like what it said. It's been run through rollers that has cracked that kernel. All right, and why do we do that? Because if you look here on the inside and you can see the little white, okay, that is the starch. And so another name for corn is a grain. And a grain is also called a concentrate, okay? A grain is a concentrate. This is what the bacteria break down and make volatile fatty acids for energy. We also get a little bit of protein from corn, but not much. Our grains are where we're getting our energy, okay? So write that down, look down there. Another word for grain is concentrate. And then we also have in a lot of feeds, flake corn. Okay, and so is there a difference in cracked corn versus flake corn? Well, if you're feeding a couple show lambs, no, there's not. If I had a whole bunch of feedlot lambs on feed, then, and I had a good place to get flake corn, and what flake corn is, is we've added heat and temperature and rolled it. And so it's kind of like a, a Frosted flake cereal that you guys may eat in the morning. But the main thing that we're doing is increasing the digestibility, okay? The ability of the little bacteria to break this down and make their products. So these are very common grains or concentrates that are in our lamb feed that make up the majority of our diet. In some areas, we also use Milo. Another name for Milo is sorghum. And so you can see it's a very small seed. So you have to process this one. You have to grind the Milo, all right? We don't use this a lot down here in this area. Uh, Milo can cause some urinary calculi problems in our animals. So most of our feeds stay away from that. But it's a good feed. Energy wise, corn and Milo are pretty much the same, okay? In terms of their energy. Now, here's a product we see in a lot of our starter rations, whole oats, all right? And a lot of times people like to use oats in our diet to decrease the protein and increase the fiber. So oats provide us some energy, but the main thing that we're getting from these oats is fiber. And so that's why horse people like to feed oats because it's a good source of fiber. Now in our show lamb feeds, <clears throat> We like to use barley, and so this barley has been processed, so it is digestible. Otherwise, it would look a whole lot like these oats, okay, until it was processed, okay. So you can see it's been rolled. This is rolled barley, and barley is a very good energy source. It's much like corn. The difference between the two is barley gives our animals a harder finish. And so as lamb exhibitors, we want our lambs to be hard. And so barley puts a fat on that typically is hard. And so most of these products are somewhere around 10% protein. And what did we say our lamb feeds need to be? Somewhere in that 15 to 18% protein, depending on the age. All right. So how do we get our protein levels up? Well, this is where we come into our protein sources and some very common protein sources that we're going to use in our lamb feeds are cottonseed meal. And we've got a little example of this. Where does cottonseed meal come from? Okay. Well, in Texas, we grow a lot of cotton. Okay. And so cottonseed meal is a byproduct. And I know you hear a lot of commercials that talk about byproducts are bad. Well, I'm here to tell you that byproducts are good. It makes us more efficient, okay? And so we have our cotton plant, we harvest our cotton, we take the, the fiber from the cotton and spin it into thread and we make clothes out of it. And when it gets done, we have this product, okay? This is called whole cotton seed. And so what we're going to do is take this whole cotton seed and we will press it. And we get an oil out of there. And after we press it, it gives us a couple different things, the products that we're gonna use in our sheep feed. One is cottonseed meal. It's about 41% protein. 
And so it doesn't take a lot of this to increase the protein in our diet. Soybean meal comes from the soybean plant, okay? And so soybean meal is a great source of protein. We use this a lot in our lamb diets when we're trying to get those lambs on feed because it's very palatable. That means it tastes good, okay? And so soybean meal is one of those. It's also very high protein, and it's important that we keep that in there to make our feeds taste good, okay? And so another product, and we're going to backtrack just a little bit. And so soybean meal and cottonseed meal are what we call degradable protein. That means when they go into this rumen, okay, the little bacteria break them down into a certain amino acid and make whatever protein the bacteria need. Now then, I'm trying to grow muscle in my lambs. I want as much muscle as I can get. And what's muscle made of? Protein, amino acids. So that means if I can sneak a little bit of extra protein or a different type of amino acid past these bacteria and I get it to the abomasum, then I can get a better increase in production. A little more muscle, a little more milk production. Anything that I need, I can get just a little better if I have something called a bypass protein. And so one thing that you'll see in a lot of, of our show feeds is that we will use a little bit of fish meal, okay? Just a little bit of fish meal. And so fish meal is very, very high in protein. So it doesn't take a lot of this. <clears throat> and we'll only use a very small amount in your feed. Number one, if you've ever smelled fish meal, you can tell real fast what it is. It's very fishy. If you've got a pet fish, it's pretty much what you feed your pet fish, okay? So we don't want to put a lot of that in our lamb feeds because it doesn't taste good. And so those are some of the products that we use to increase the protein in our diet, okay? Now, one other protein out there that you'll often see in a feed label if it says urea. And so most of our feed show feeds don't contain a lot of urea. Urea is kind of a type of salt, right? You're probably not gonna be able to see it on this white backboard, but it, it looks like salt, okay? And so urea is one of those products that we don't necessarily use in our show feeds because we want more of the digestible type protein, whereas our cottonseed meal and our soybean meal are somewhere around 40% protein. Urea is 281% protein. And so we don't use a lot of that in our show feeds. Now, we talked about what did our rumen need? What did the bacteria need? They need fiber. So in order to get that 12 to 13% fiber in our diet, we're gonna use another byproduct called cottonseed hulls, okay? And this comes from processing our whole cottonseed, okay? We get our cottonseed hulls, and this has the, the seed head or seed kernel shell, if you will, and the fiber. And so this provides a very, very good fiber source for our animals. And so in our sheep and goat diets, have a lot of cottonseed hulls in it that work very good. Another product that we'll put in there oftentimes is a product called dried distiller's grains, okay? And dried distiller's grains is a product that comes from the ethanol industry. And so the ethanol industry, we take the corn, they take this corn and they ferment it. And what that uses all the carbohydrates, okay? The ethanol fermentation is basically the same thing going on in the rumen. And it leaves, okay, a byproduct called DDG. And so this product is a great product, smells good, tastes good, it's very high in protein, and it's also pretty high in fat. Now, we talked about <clears throat> increasing fat in our diet. And so one of the ways that we'll do this, as well as increasing palatability, it's kind of like your mom making broccoli. How is she going to get you to eat it? Well, she's going to put uh, Velveeta cheese on it. And so on our feeds, we're going to take all of these in very specific proportions, okay? 
And then we can add a product called molasses, right? And so molasses does a couple different things. It keeps the dust down, it holds the feed together, and it increases the palatability or flavor, okay? It makes the feed taste good. And so as we go through there and we look at our feed tags now, we kind of talk about we have a lot of grain, and our grains are high in phosphorus. And we talked about we need calcium, right, especially in ruminant diets. So high phosphorus, now we've balanced for energy and fat. We've balanced for protein. Now we have to balance for our calcium phosphorus ratio. And so one of the products that we'll use is called calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is used to increase the amount of calcium in our diet. Okay. And so we put that in there, so basically ground limestone is what it is, right? And that increases our calcium level. So we have two parts calcium, one part phosphorus. Now then, if we have a medicated feed, and if you're buying animals and you see it says medicated, well, the medication that's probably on there is a product called Dequinate, okay? Or you may have heard it called Decox. And so this is a medical a medicine that we add to the feed in very small amounts, and this helps prevent coccidia, okay? Now, it's not going to cure coccidia, and if your animal gets a bad case of coccidia, it's not going to treat it, but it's a good preventative that we put in the feed. And then, okay, there's lots of different other trace minerals. When we looked on our feed sheet and our feed tag, we saw the, the selenium, the copper, the molybdenum, all of the different trace minerals. And then we have vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C, vitamin B, all the different vitamins that our animals need to be healthy. That is what we have now, a trace mineral package. And so it's a pretty standard product that's got all of the minerals and vitamins that our sheep needs, okay? And so this is then added to our feed. So when you get your feed in that feed sack, the stuff that goes on in order to get that right for your animals, okay? It's a very special process that we go through and every feed tag has to be checked, okay? To make sure you have the protein that you want. We want to make sure we have our calcium phosphorus. And so people that specialize and have degrees in nutrition work for these feed companies and do the different ratios to come up with show feeds. So for the majority of our show feeds, all the ingredients are very similar, okay? And so next time you open your bag of feed, and I'm going to come around here. <clears throat> We're feeding our sheep, okay? And you're looking at this bag of feed. I'm going to ease up here. So I've got two different samples, okay? They look very, very similar. This feed is a 16% protein, 5% fat. This feed is a 12.5% protein, 2% fat. And so I can see the difference in the grain. I have got corn. I've got cottonseed hulls in both of these. This one has more oats in it than this one. This one over here has barley, okay? And so a lot of times on our textured feed like this, you'll see these little pellets. And oftentimes your sheep may not like to eat these little pellets. It may take them a while. Part of the problem that we run into when we make these pellets, this is what contains our vitamins, our minerals, our trace mineral package and any, any kind of meals that we can compress into a pellet, oftentimes they don't taste good. So a lot of times feed companies will put some type of flavoring in there to increase their uh, palatability or wanting to eat that. So hopefully that kind of helped you out. And so we talked about why copper is important. Hope everybody knows what a bypass protein is now. We talked about non-protein nitrogen. So non-protein nitrogen is urea. So if you see something that's NPN on your feed tag, that means it's coming from urea. It's not a problem, okay? But 
It's not a natural like cottonseed meal or one of those type of things. So microbial crude protein, that's one that I want you to know because that is the bacteria. That bacteria, as he grows and washes out of the rumen over here to the abomasum, I'm going to feed my animal this feed. It's 15 to 16 percent protein. It's got a certain type of amino acids. That little bacteria doesn't care. Okay, he breaks it down and makes whatever he needs. That little bacteria is a great chemist, right? And so when he, the bacteria, gets here to the abomasum, he becomes the protein source for your sheep. All right, Dottie, we got any questions out there? Yeah, Dr. Ramsey, just to start, I want to say thank you for that very thorough explanation of lots of different um, things that go into our feed. And I certainly learned a lot about different um, commodities that are used to, to make sure that we have a really high quality show lamb feed. Uh, you talked about a couple of products that are the same. So, for example, the corn or the oats or the barley and different types. So whether it be rolled or flaked. And so um, I guess we understand the reason for that is to increase digestibility. Can you speak a little bit to if there's a difference in terms of quality or digestibility between those different types of feedstuffs, even if they're the same exact um, thing, such as corn? So I guess to put it a little more simply, is steam rolled corn better or equally the same as flaked corn or or oats or barley or anything? So an, that's a good question, Dottie. <clears throat> now, on a large scale, if I was feeding thousands and thousands of sheep, I would probably want steam flaked corn. I would probably see a difference in that. But where we're feeding it out of a feed sack, and it's normally going to be a couple weeks old by the time it's flaked somewhere and it's hauled, most steam flake corn is going to look like crack corn. So there's very little difference there versus steam flake versus crack corn in our situation. All right, so as we ease out here, we've got our helpers. And so we didn't have a lamb that we could use, but we have a steer. And so this steer has the same type of rumen, right? Same type of digestive system. And this is what we call a rumen cannulated animal. And so he is got a big plug right here and you can look into the rumen and see all that feed and hay. We can see some corn in there. We can see some hay in there. And so what we're going to do is it's not going to be able to see a whole lot. Get it in there a little closer. There we go. And so how big is the rumen? Well, on this steer, this rumen is probably holds about 55 gallons worth of feed, hay, and water, right? And so what we're going to do now is we're going to reach in there and get a little bit of this rumen fluid. There you go. You just need to give a book. And so you can tell right here, this is what we call the grass mat, that it kind of floats up on top. But we want something with a little juice in it, okay? And so here's what we get, some good rumen juice coming out of there. It's got a very sweet, strong smell to it. You all see that? So that's rumen fluid. That contains the bacteria. And so we're going to go back in there now. Can everybody see that? This guy's pretty full. Imagine what a 55 gallon drum, that's good. They can look in there. We're gonna peek in there one more time. Y'all like that? All right, so we're gonna go back in now, Dottie. Anybody got any questions as we're traveling? You might go ahead and, and show, let's show them what bacteria look like. <clears throat> yeah, sounds good, Dr. Ramsey. You, uh, you promised that we were going to get down and dirty and in the room and, and you were not kidding. So they just now we're going to go ahead and, and, and show uh, kind of what goes on in there and what it looks like as you get set up on uh, your microscope. And hopefully we'll see something similar. Um, but just for folks to start getting their minds around it, let's see what um, inside the room is going on. Put it over here where I can see it. All right. So we've got this little video that we recorded earlier 
that you can see all the different bacteria. So that's what's going on inside your animal. Okay? That's what's making him survive. And so we're going to look here. Y'all just keep watching that. All right. So, Dottie, you can switch over here now. Switch back to us. You got so, it, Dr. Ramsey. All right. So we've got our sample that we put on our microscope. And so as we go through here, you can see all the little bacteria moving around. There goes a the bacteria. There's a big old protozoa. See, all of these are the bugs that we talk about when you talk about bugs in the rumen. That's why it's so critical that we take care of the system because all of these little bacteria that you guys see around there are digesting that corn, they're digesting that soybean meal and cottonseed meal, and they're making products, okay? They're making energy in the form of volatile fatty acids. So a lot of different things when we feed a monogastric, a certain supplement, it works one way, but when we feed a supplement to a ruminant, it has this whole thing that it has to go through. And a lot of things, when I feed it to a ruminant animal, it doesn't come out the same way that it goes in because these little bacteria are what change them, right? <clears throat> now, here's a question. Can your sheep live without these bacteria? No, he cannot live without these bacteria. So it's super important. Anytime your animal gets sick and you have to treat him with an antibiotic, what antibiotics kill? Bacteria, right? And so it's always a good thing to go in and give him some type of probiotics, okay? When you start drenching your animal, you wanna be careful and start it at a very low rate because what has to happen, these guys, that sheep maybe has been outside eating grass and so there's more of these little fiber digesting bacteria that are swimming around. And so as we go through here and look, it takes time. Look at this big guy plowing through here. Okay. He looks like a tank going through there. You know, see him? Oh, look at this one. There's another big, great big one right here. And so all of these little bacteria, here comes one blowing through there. <clears throat> you can see him taking up all these little particles of feed. Okay. And so if it's a piece of grain, he's making volatile fatty acids. That's what gives energy to your sheep. If he takes some cottonseed meal or soybean meal, he breaks that down into amino acids and makes them into his body. He incorporates that into his body. And then when he washes out and he gets down here to the abomasum, okay, that's where he is digested. That becomes the protein source for your sheep, okay? unless we put a little bypass protein in there, such as fish meal or feather meal, those type of products, that this little bacteria, you can't break them down. And so they pass through here and get to the abomasum. So that may be one thing to look for in your feed that it, does it have some bypass proteins, okay? So as we wrap up, I hope you guys enjoyed that. We got any questions. So as you think about those different things, it's always important. <clears throat> If you don't have a good rumen environment, you don't have good bugs, okay, in that rumen, your sheep is not going to do good. He's not going to perform well. And so the best thing to do is protect that rumen. And that when you start drenching, and one of the things when you start drenching, uh, I'll use Dine, for example. It's a great product. It's super high fat. But if I get too much of that in there, what happens? These little bacteria go crazy. It's just like you getting the whole access to cake and ice cream. It's real good for a while, but then after a while, guess what? You're going to have a bad stomach ache. But in your situation, you get over it. Your sheep, if he gets too much fat, too much feed all at once, right? He doesn't have a stomach like you and I. He has this rumen. And what happens is those little bacteria do their job. They do it too good. And our pH goes from 6.8 down to 5.2. And when that happens, it basically kills the bacteria. 
that's called acidosis. And if it's bad enough and you don't catch it in time and treat him, he will die. Okay? And so the rumen is a great animal. They're built to use forages. So it's very important that we keep a good fiber in their, in their diet. And so on our show lambs, you know, just a good handful of hay every day, twice a day. Okay? At least once a day. That much, not going to give him a big belly and it will keep him much healthier and keep that rumen and these little bacteria, right, keep them happy. Because those bacteria are what make the B vitamins. They make energy. They become protein. And so without them, our animals don't survive. All right. Excellent. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. This was certainly interesting and, and really a treat to see under the microscope of an angle of things that we don't get to see very often. So thanks for taking us there. We do have quite a bit of questions coming in and I'm going to start okay. feeding those your way real quick. People are wondering, you know, they joined us midway and they're wondering if we have these videos archived somewhere. And I just want to let them know that the answer is yes. We have recorded every one of our videos together so far. We've talked about a wide range of things from you know, selection of, of lambs to um, showmanship, feed nutrition, uh, health and maintenance, uh, the whole whole gamut of topics we've covered and all of those have been recorded and they're posted online at our website at www.texasyouthlivestock.com. Also, you could find all of them right here on our Facebook page. So I want to remind and invite everybody to go ahead and like and follow that page so that you can see all of our past videos, and then you'd be reminded of anything we're doing in the future, which are going to be some really cool things along the way as well. So just wanted to remind folks of that. Now I have a question for you, Dr. Ramsey. Someone's wondering, you mentioned that, you know, with the use of antibiotics or different drenches, it can, uh, you know, sometimes mess up that bacteria count or their effectiveness or efficiency inside that rumen. They're wondering that if that does happen, how could you get it started back up? What would be the next steps if something did take a wrong turn along the way? Good, good question, Dottie. And so the first thing that would be good that we talked about was giving that animal a shot of B complex, the B vitamins, because these bacteria are ones that make the B vitamins. Second thing is any type of probiotic. Now, a lot of our higher quality feeds will have probiotics already mixed into them. Okay. And so that would be one thing that you would check on. But probiotic is the bacteria that you're giving it to him. If he's really bad and you really need to jumpstart him and you've tried the probiotics and it doesn't work, one thing you might do is you may need some assistance from your veterinarian is take a healthy lamb or goat down to your veterinarian and drench them with a little extra water. And then we're going to take a tube and run the tube down and pull some rumen fluid out of the healthy animal just like this, if I had a sick lamb and his rumen wasn't doing good, I would come get me some of this rumen fluid out of another animal and I would drench him with that, okay? And you can use cow rumen fluid, yes. If they're on, you know, if you've got a show steer or a show heifer, they're gonna be on a similar diet. And so, yeah, the big thing that we wanna do is get that bacteria back in there, okay? So probiotics would be the first choice or, you know, if you've got somebody, if you live by a packing house and somebody is harvesting a beef or a lamb or a goat, you can harvest some rumen fluid there or just pass a tube and siphon some out of them. Good question. All right. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. Uh, it was a great question. And, and we even have some folks commenting on Facebook that this week was especially awesome. And I'd have to agree. Uh, we really took an interesting look here at a different side of things. But going back to the feed and, you know, the normal feed schedule and what we do, we have a question regarding the day or week of a show. Would your feeding schedule or what you're feeding look different for that type of preparation for show? <laughs> So if I'm feeding, the only thing that is going to change is probably the amount of feed that I'm feeding. Time, everything else is going to be pretty much the same. So from about a, a week or 10 days out before the show, I'm tracking the weights on those lambs. And so if you reference our last week, we have that card that you can use so you can track weights. 
I'm going to start tracking weights on that lamb, and I'm looking at his fill. How much fill does he have? And so remember, where does fill come from? Well, in our ruminant animal, most of that fill is coming from the rumen and his digestive system. And from the time I feed this sheep, okay, this feed, and until it comes out as sheep pellets and he poops, okay, it's going to be somewhere between 96 and 124 hours before it gets through there. And so what I want to do is monitor his fill level. If I'm trying to pull some weight off, I'm probably going to start backing him down a little bit. And so if he's getting three pounds of feet a day, I may back him down to two and a half pounds a day until I get him and I'm weighing him and I'm looking at him until I get him right where I want. And normally when I get him where I want, then he eats that same amount from then until he goes into the show ring. And so I get them ready and have them ready before we even go on the trailer going to the show. When we get to the show, I can pretty much tell you what he's going to weigh. And so my feeding regime doesn't change a whole lot once we get to the show. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. We do have a couple more questions um, to ask, but I want to remind everybody one last time, any last minute questions you have, go ahead and type those in the comments and we'll get to them before we wrap up or we'll sure, sure try. The next question we have um, is about B complex. Some folks are wanting to know how much and how often they should give B complex to um, show lambs and goats. So what I always try to do and, and always read the label, uh, that's the first thing that we need to do. B complex normally is going to be somewhere around three cc's per hundred pounds or poor sheep or goat. So normally what we would do is about every three to four weeks, they got three cc's of B-complex subcutaneous, okay? So even though they're getting all the hay, they're getting everything, is a feel-good thing for me, right? <clears throat> because the complex was the thymine. I've got a young lamb. He's fast-growing. He needs lots of thymine. I'm feeding him a high-concentrate ration. So everybody remember concentrate? right? That is the grain. I'm feeding him lots of grain so it takes more thymine to metabolize for these little guys to do their job, okay? They need thymine too. And so it just would worry about doctoring a lamb that had thymine deficiency. So about every three to four weeks, three cc's, you'll be great. All right, Dr. Ramsey, one of the last questions here, dealing with supplements, and I know that, that we can call some of the other um, different things you had on your table there a supplement, but what I'm asking is about supplements, not like corn or, or oats or barley or, or different parts of the feed that make up the feedstuffs, but really other types of supplements, and we have a whole gamut of options, right, in this world. We right, see that there are lots of those different over. things out there. Yeah, there's, there's a million. So I guess the question to you is um, not necessarily which one's best or, or worst or any of that, but is it necessary? And is it something that we need to be adding to show lamb feed? So, you know, everybody's got their own opinion of that. <clears throat> and so part of my problem is I've spent too much time studying these little bugs right here. And I know what goes on in the rumen. Uh, a lot of the supplements out there were developed for monogastrics. Okay. They do a good job in humans and pigs and horses, but when we put them in a ruminant animal and they have to go in this ruminant environment and they come up against these guys, they get broken down and changed into something that probably doesn't really do us a lot of good. Now, there's probably some supplements out there that work. It's one of those deals. If you think it works, then definitely use it, okay? But try it and see how you like it. See if you can see a big difference. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Ramsey. That's one of the last questions we have, unless anybody has any last minute thoughts here on Facebook. But as we wrap up, I just want to thank everybody for following along with us this week and, and through all the sessions we've had so far. Like we mentioned, we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff and all of that is posted on our website and here on our Facebook. So real quick, um, you know, before we get off, I want to remind everybody to go ahead and like and follow our Facebook page because we do a whole bunch more than just these um, sheep videos, even though they're super great. 
I want to say real quick today at noon, we did a session with our fall major livestock shows. So we heard from the show officials from the State Fair of Texas and the Heart of Texas Fair, and they gave us all of the latest news and updates for their shows coming up. And just as a teaser, as you get to watch that, um, like I said, it's recorded, it's posted on our Facebook, but I'll let you know that those shows are happening and they're planning full steam ahead. Of course, we know that with everything else in, in the season we're in, it's going to look a little bit different, but just want you to know that those folks are committed to providing a great experience for our young people, and you absolutely should be trucking forward with your market lamb, market goat, all of your all of your the species projects, because we are really looking forward to a great fall, and you're going to find all that and so much more on our Facebook page. And as we look to next week, Dr. Ramsey, um, you know, you and I are going to take a break off from our sheep segment, but I'd like to tease you with a little, um, little bit of fun and change things up. We may be talking about goats next week, so we'll certainly keep you up to date on our goat adventures and what we're going to be seeing and talking about next week um, with that. But the only way you're going to know is if you follow our page, like our posts, and um, follow along with us at Texas Youth Livestock and Agriculture. So with that, Dr. Ramsey, everybody's saying it was a great week, and I agree, and that's all thanks to you setting up a great session, taking us right inside the room and talking about feed, nutrition, hmm. and all the things that we're interested in. So um, another great week. Thanks again, Dr. Ramsey. And, hey, it's uh, been great, Dottie. From you. If they've got any questions, they can email me at sramsey.tamu.edu. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions or give me a call. Hey, it's been great. I've had a great time doing this. We'll talk to you all later.